So it's uh, very nice to be here again after a short break. And thank you all for coming. Uh, so maybe I'll start by uh, uh, briefly recalling what happened in the first uh, three lectures, uh, because we have two weeks of a uh, break, so maybe somebody has forgotten. Some of the details, and so, so, so from the previous three lectures. Yeah, so maybe I'll write it a bit uh, schematic. So, like our big goal of uh, this series of lectures is to prove the universal optimality of the E8 and Leach lattice. of lattice we denoted by lambda d, and here d is the dimension, and it's always either 8 or 24. And so this was our big goal. And so just uh, <coughs> briefly to recall you what it means then, what is the universal optimality? So it means that, so for each configuration of points C inside a d-dimensional Euclidean space, uh, such that the density of this configuration is 1, which is the same as the density of uh, Leach lattice and E8 lattice, uh, and for each positive constant alpha, what we require, what we require is that the Gaussian energy of uh, the configuration C will always be bounded by below by the minimal, <coughs> by the uh, energy of uh, our lattice, either uh, E8 lattice in dimension 8 or Leach lattice in dimension D. And so here, uh, so and alpha is related to p. So here p is the place to write it. Maybe here we'll write it. P it's a Gaussian with a, a exponent alpha. And so this uh, energy it's an energy of mutual in interaction of our points, and we think that our points, they repel each other, and the, uh, their energy is given by this function where r is a distance, it depends only on distance between two points. And so we take a normalized sum over all pairs, and uh, in this way compute the energy of the whole configuration. And so what we also uh, explained in the previous lecture, that our method for proving this uh, universal optimality is the linear programming. So it's a linear programming a method which is uh, used quite a lot in this kind of geometric optimization problems and particular linear programming we are using in this case it was adopted by uh, adaptation found by Kohn and Kumar and so what we will show is that linear programming it implies universal optimality. And so linear programming, it is, it means that we need to show an existence of a certain uh, function. So we need to show that there exists for each alpha we'll find a special function f alpha, which would be a radial Schwartz function. such that the following conditions hold is that it's that this f alpha should not exceed the our energy profile so to say for all points in the Euclidean space and also it's Fourier transform has to be non-negative. 
And if we <coughs> are able to construct such a function like this, then for uh, configurations of density one, so this uh, number, the difference of the values of this uh, auxiliary of, of the Fourier transform of the auxiliary function at zero and the function itself at zero, it gives us an lower bound for the energy of any possible configuration. And if we wanted our bound to be sharp, it means that this difference has to be exactly equal to the energy of uh, our lattice, optimal lattice in question. And so what we also observed last time that, so we, assume, we suppose that such an uh, optimal function does exist. And then what will happen is then the existence of uh, our optimal lattices, it will pose certain restrictions on this function. So now the, if we also, so the existence of this optimal lattice lambda d, it will then imply that if such a function exists, then it satisfies the following conditions. So that these uh, inequalities, they have to become sharp at uh, the, the vectors which have the same length as some non-zero vectors from our lattice. And so now what uh, also comes into play is that now we know actually, dual sorry? Uh, dual, yes, but yes, you're right, dual, dual, but it's, yeah. it's self-dual, so it's the same, right? And uh, uh, so now uh, what comes into play is that the, uh, the vector lenses of vectors in both lattices, uh, they have very nice algebraic structure. So they will be just, so these possible lenses, they will be uh, square roots of uh, even integers starting from some, like from non-zero, which would be the lens of shortest uh, vector. And uh, actually this uh, coincidence or this good property of, uh, of the both lattices make this problem somehow accessible for us. They give us hope, hope to solve it. And that's because we observe that there exists a Fourier interpolation formula. So which can helps us, which helps us to reconstruct a, a sh radial Schwartz function exactly from these values. And so the radio, this interpolation formula is like this. So here again, le let d be our dimension and n0 be the number which depends on d. It will be the length of shortest vector in our lattice. So if dimension is 8, then n0, okay, so it's the length of shortest vector squared divided by 1. So it's almost the length of shortest vector. So it's either 8, 1 or 24, 2. And so then the interpolation formula says, uh, f says that there exists a sequence of Schwartz functions with the radial Schwartz functions on the corresponding Euclidean space such that for any radial Schwartz function f, we can reconstruct this function just from its values as the square roots of even integers and the same information for its derivatives and for, for its Fourier transform and derivatives so of the Fourier transform. So we would have a formula like this.
And so this is also the, pro the formula we discussed on the previous uh, lecture. And so just uh, and so how are we how how would we approach proving such a formula? So what we are going to do, we are going to cons to <coughs> reduce the proof of this uh, Fourier interpolation formula to a solution of a certain functional equation. And so the functional equation relates to this formula in the following way. So let's consider the following generating series, which will include all the <coughs> functions a n and b n of the interpolating basis. So here, what we do, we do the following. Consider the following sum. It starts again from n zero, goes to infinity, and we take functions a n of x and multiply them by this, by the coefficients, e to pi, pi i n tau. And the same we do with b n, only with b n for convenience we will need this uh, additional coefficient depending on n, and also tau so that we can distinguish between a n and b n. So we consider a function like this, and also another function x tilde, which will contain the same information about the Fourier transforms of these functions in variable x. And so now what we do, now we take our interpolation formula and apply this interpolation formula to a complex Gaussian. So now what we do, so, so interpolation formula, if it is applied to the following function f, which is 2 pi length of x squared times tau. And here tau is a variable at the upper half plane. Then what we get is the following functional equation. Uh, yes, right. Thank you. Yes, and so the functional equation is like this. So the functional equation itself tells us that the function, namely this ga complex Gaussian e to the pi norm of s squared tau, it will be equal to f of x tau plus uh, the following modification of f tilde. And so also implicitly we have two more equations for these functions. For example, we know that the function f is, so to say, linearly periodic. So if we take a second difference of these functions with, with step of one in variable tau, then we will get zero. And the same is true for f tilde. And so same for And so now what we want to do is to solve this functional equation, then it will give us explicit form for our uh, interpolation formula. And so here, one important thing that once we have the explicit interpolation formula, we can also find 
this function f alpha because we know all the information about the function f alpha which is needed in the interpolation formula. And so from the interpolation formula we will see that not only that we can find the function f alpha explicitly but it also will actually coincide with some value values of our generating function f. So it will be the same as our generating function f, only it has to be, for the second parameter we have need to take a purely imaginary number i alpha. So this would be a <coughs> the number the imaginary axis on the positive uh, half plane. And so, so now with uh, this picture, what is still remains to be done? So here there are this is our uh, main goal is to prove the universal optimality. So what do we still need to prove the universal optimality? So the for the universal optimality, we still need to do the following. So So for actually for both for universal optimality and for uh, maybe I sk skipped one more step about how so before we write well what still has to be done so let's write down about what is our uh, strategy for solving the functional equation so. And so what we are going to do, we are going to search for our function f in a very special form. So we want to search for our function f in a form like this. So f of x tau, we want to define it as a following expression. And so this, this is part comes from our knowledge about the uh, so some sp special values of uh, uh, the, this function. And so this part gives, uh, will give us the uh, double zeros. And uh, so and it turns out that the Multiplier here, it's convenient to to assume that it has a follow or the following form of a and so this function k which we want to take here. We also assume that it is a, a neuromorphic kernel on the product of two uh, upper half planes and that it has the following properties. So, so what the way we have introduced this kernel in the previous uh, lectures. So the properties of K. So first it's that we want K to be a meromorphic function which is defined <coughs> on the <coughs> product of two upper half planes. and not only along our path of integration. So other properties that if you look at k of tau z as a function of uh, z and tau fixed, then it will have only simple poles. Then 
the points where like, Z and tau, they have to be invariant with respect to action of SL to Z. And also we want our function to satisfy the homogeneous version of the functional equation. And so the slash notation, we introduced it on our previous lecture. And so this, the, this should be true for all elements A, which belong to the following, uh, to the ideal. And this is an ideal inside of a group algebra of uh, <coughs> PSL to Z. And it's generated by these two elements. So first, T minus 1 squared and S T minus 1 squared. And in the previous lecture, we discussed how to, the relation between uh, th this uh, notation with the slash operator and uh, the functional equation as it's written on this blackboard. Here, R, it's a group algebra of SL to Z. And so now, <coughs> so K has one, two more important properties. So one of them, it's the, so we know that it has simple poles at tau equals Z, but the residues, they also have to be certain particular numbers. So this will be true for all elements of our uh, group ring. And phi, it's a particular uh, linear map from the uh, group algebra module of the ideal i. So it's a linear map. And uh, on the previous lectures, we have seen that uh, this quotient is actually finite dimensional and it has dimension equal to 6. So it's to <coughs> define this map, it will be sufficient for us to define it on some uh, representatives. And so we define it in the following way. So So on the last, in the previous lectures, we have seen that these six elements, they are indeed representatives for this quotient. And so we define our linear functional to be one applied to element t and zero applied to all other representatives we have chosen. And so another important conditions, which I probably will not repeat in de details, but we also had certain gross conditions on K near the boundary. So gross, con so gross conditions in, ge in general at the boundary and certain particular swans at the cusps. For example, we know that this kernel, it has to vanish as uh, tau goes to zero or to infinity, and that it has a pole in uh, z as z goes to infinity, but this pole has, so to say, bounded order. And this integral of f with the integral of k, is it convert absolute convergent, or you should kind of regularize somewhere? Yeah, so we'll have to regularize it. So to 
So, <coughs> so this is our big picture, but actually this integral here, it will be uh, defined only, as for now it will be defined only, so this will be well defined for, so. First it is well defined for tau in the domain uh, D, which was this uh, standard fundamental domain for gamma 2. Uh, and it's somehow, so, so a priori it's probably clear it's that the, it is defined uh, away from uh, uh, SL to Z images of imaginary axis. Uh, but because we have so many residues uh, vanishing here, so it's actually well defined on this domain D. And uh, also because uh, uh <coughs> this kernel, it has a pole as a second uh, variable goes to zero and to, you know, as it goes to zero, I think it's fine. It's, uh, the pole is, uh, the second variable goes to infinity. So, so it's only defined, well defined if the absolute value of our vector, Euclidean vector x, it has to be bigger than square root of 2 and 0 minus 2. So in dimension 8 we have a problem only at point 0, but in dimension 24 we have to be careful around a ball of radius uh, square root of 2 around 0. Do you expect that because we kind of inserted a 0 where there shouldn't be in dimension 24? Uh, yes, yes. So it's because it's because we we know that these conditions hold for all lattices which are uh, in uh, for for uh, for all uh, vectors which are in the lattice. And for example, in Leech lattice, the first possible so to say possible lens is omitted. And so we actually we will not uh, have uh, the equality here. And so now what is our strategy to proceed? So yes, maybe I will say a few more words about the uh, kernel. So it's a proposition. It is that of, so the kernel K with all these properties and with gross conditions properly specified as we did it in the previous lecture, the kernel becomes unique. So the so the kernel with this property is unique. And we can write it down explicitly. So it will be kernel which first will be two different actually two different kernels for two different dimensions. And we will write in the following way. So here it's a Ramanujan's delta function taking into some power, which will depend on dimension. So here we will have a holomorphic function of two variables tau and z divided by difference of j invariance, which will give us our simple poles. And what we know about the holomorphic function P. So what we know that in tau variable it satisfies the homogeneous functional equation. Uh, so it would be only in weight uh, as a will be now not d divided by over, over 2 but uh, d plus 12 alpha which comes from this uh, from this term. Uh, sorry? Yeah, you write P, just on the left of the Okay, okay. Thank you. And so also, we re somehow, our gross conditions actually require that after multiplication with the suitable powers of delta functions, we will get function which is uh, belongs to this class curly P, so which is uh, holomorphic and also has moderate growth. And so this will be with respect to variable tau and with respect to variable z, we know that it also 
uh, our function will be annihilated by a different ideal, which is actually related to the ideal i and uh, linear functional uh, phi, which we defined before. So again, we have 12 beta. So here we have a different ideal. And it also will be a holomorphic function of moderate growth. And so what we can do, we can actually compute uh, these uh, functions p explicitly in terms of uh, classical modular forms. And so now what uh, remains to be done, so now we have two different uh, objectives, so to say. One of them is our primary goal to prove the universal optimality and another uh, <coughs> Goal for, for this course is to prove the Fourier interpolation formula. And so for the universal optimality. What we still what needs to be done now. So first what we have to do, of course, we have to uh, show that the function uh, f is which we defined uh, above that it's defined not only for uh, for x outside of uh, this ball around origin, but actually for all uh, vectors. So what we need to do, we need to extend f to all x in Rd. But this is uh, this can be actually uh, easily done because. For our kernel k, we can write its uh, Fourier expansion in the, the, in the second variable. And it will have like two first, first two terms in this uh, expansion. They will have negative exponents, so they will be responsible for this polyt infinity. And so what we can do, we can just uh, uh, integrate uh, this term separately. And so here in the formula, somehow the Singularity, which we get after this integration, it will be again just a simple pole, and it will be killed by this uh, sine squared, which we are multiplying by. So it's uh, easy. Actually, it's an easy task. Uh, then we also have to work a little bit to show that this function actually belongs to. So it's. Uh, radial Schwartz function <laughs> in variable x. Function of x with an additional para parameter tau. And so then also what we have to do, we have to uh, be able to compute the Fourier transform of this function. Uh, so the Fourier transform again with respect to the Euclidean variable x. So the show that the Fourier transform of this with respect to x. And so this time it will be actually the function f tilde, which we have defined before, which is related to f by uh, this functional equation. And it also has a nice integral representation. So this time it will, it has the integral representation like this. So it equals to, so here again we have the sine squared. Times the integral from zero to infinity. And here instead of integrating uh, Function k, we integrate over the following function. So this time we have an integral like this. And so this, uh, this is not a uh, uh, Exactly obvious, but here it comes with some uh, in integral, with a proper integral manipulation. 
So here we do have to work with uh, contour integrals and then to well, apply to exchange taking integrals with uh, the Fourier transform and use the fact that Fourier transform applied to the Gaussians here it uh, looks looks very nice and and so now we are almost uh, done because now the the thing which actually r reminds to for us to prove actually prove the universal optimality is only to check the positivity so and now so as we discussed uh, last time so now to sh to prove the positivity what we actually need to show we need to show that uh, this function is small uh, is bounded by the uh, corresponding uh, <coughs> gaussian and uh, uh, but it's actually it's, it's only it's suffice, suffice, suffices for us to prove the following to prove that actually f tilde of so now it suffices to show that So th this function is non-negative when alpha is a positive uh, real number. And so here, because we have uh, actually integral representation, is also helpful for us here, uh, because what turns out that we what we can show we can show that the uh, this. This kern uh, kernel function k, which uh, so this modification of kernel function k, let me denote it by k again also with hat, and th this time hat it does not mean the Fourier transform because here the transformation which actually applied to k is different. It's only for our convenience, what we also will have is that this kernel k it is positive if alpha and t are both positive numbers. So if we look at this function defined on the product of two upper half planes and we restrict uh, uh, ourselves to product of two imaginary axes, then <coughs> this restriction of the meromorphic kern kernel is positive. Uh, and so this works, uh, this helps us to prove inequality at the all points where the our integral representation for function uh, f and uh, f tilde everywhere where it, where it converges. And we still have a problem uh, in dimension 24 in this uh, small ball of radius square root of 2 because there our integral representation does not converge. So knowing uh, something about sine of uh, function under the integral does not tell us anything about uh, the sign of the result. So this is something what we have to handle separately. So also what we have to do, we have to prove separately that the function f tilde, which corresponds to dimension 24, it is actually positive or no negative for all vectors of lengths smaller than square root of 2. And so this, uh, both inequalities, the, the only way we found to prove them is by Checking it by com by computer by numerical computations, and so this is something I will speak about in our ne next lecture. I will tell in more details about how how we proved these two inequalities. And so now, what still uh, remains is the interpolation formula. And as you see, that for universal optimality, we actually did not need the uh, interpolation formula itself. Somehow interpolation formula, it was an inspiration for us. It showed us a way how to construct 
this magic functions f alpha, but the interpolation formula itself is not needed uh, for, <coughs> for proving universal optimality. Uh, however, if we thought that maybe it's a nice result on its own, uh, so uh, for this reason, maybe I use the space here. We also decided to, to prove the uh, interpolation formula. And so to prove interpolation formula, we need a slightly different information about the function f, capital. And so if for universal optimality, what really interests us is the positivity of uh, functions f and f tilde. Then for the uh, functional equation, what's important for us is that these functions, they can be extended to the whole upper half plane. And uh, also that uh, uh, these functions are, uh, they have nice uh <coughs> growth properties at this plane. So, so now for the interpolation formula, what we still need to do. Uh, yes, in, in, in principle we could do it in any dimension, but uh, maybe we are a bit lazy, so we did only in dimensions 8 and uh, 24. Yeah, but uh, I think like exactly the same method it would work in uh, other dimensions as well. So there is maybe small uh, differences that uh, if dimension is not divisible by eight, then maybe more modifications have to be done. Probably nodes have to be shifted by one or. So. So what do we have to do for the interpolation formula? So first for the interpolation formula, we, we, we cannot, uh, it's not enough for us to know our function on the, only on the imaginary axis, we have to extend it to the whole upper half plane. So we have to extend capital F of X and tau as a function of tau from the domain D to the all upper half plane. And then of course also we have to show that functions uh, f and f tilde as we have defi defined them, that they will satisfy the functional equation. And now for our formula to work not only formally but also to be an analytically nice formula uh, to have good convergence, for example, not to have a very rapid growth of, uh, of this basis functions a n and b n at every given point, uh, we also need to know that our functions have moderate growth. And so what more explicitly what we need, we, we take our functions, which are functions of x and tau, so now we can consider them as functions of x and tau runs as a parameter and we take the seminorms semi of the Schwarz space on these two functions so then what we get will be only functions of tau and what we want so these are seminorms that are taken with respect to x. And so what we want, we want them to have moderate growths in tau uh, for all, and this should be true for all multi-indices alpha and beta.
And so for what is what would be our plan for today would be to concentrate on the uh, interpolation formula and to prove uh, uh, the extension and the functional equation and probably we'll have no time uh, left for the growth estimates. So maybe if time remains, I will just uh, discuss this uh, a little bit. And for the next uh, lecture, I will show you our uh, numerical results and explain you how we prove the positivity. And probably I will, since I will use the projector, maybe I could even present you some more our uh, numerical results on proving positivity and also some uh, experimental results re just r related to this uh, problem and maybe other dimensions. Yeah, yeah, also, yeah, also, huge, yeah. yeah, I also can show you yeah. <laughs> this one. Uh, yes, and uh, then in the last lecture, probably I would like to uh, discuss some uh, open questions which remain. Like, for example, if you have this interpolation formula, which other interpolations for formulas uh, do we have? Or, for, or ca can we theoretically have? Or what, which other pr problems can, can be solved with this approach? And which uh, problems seem to be definitely impossible to solve with met methods like this. And so maybe we make a small uh, break. Yeah, and so for what I uh, planned to do for today is to show that uh, function f uh, defined by the formula above uh, in this uh, particular re region of, for, uh, of tau and x, it can be actually extended uh, in tau and in x uh, to a function which uh, satisfies the functional equation. And so, so probably for, for now we will work, we'll work only with uh, uh, x which is uh, uh, big enough, we will not address this uh, problem of uh, extending our function in x and we'll concentrate on extension in tau. And so first what I'm going to do is to prove the half of the proposition which I formulated in the uh, previous lecture, so which tells us that if we want to extend uh, f to the whole upper half plane. So what suffices is to extend it only to a small, uh, to a neighborhood of uh, this uh, domain D. Uh, or rather it's a uh, closure. And uh, if uh, the extension will satisfy the functional equation, then uh, the it can be extended further to the whole upper half plane. And so the proposition is the following. So let k be an even integer. And suppose that we have two <coughs> holomorphic functions, h1 and h2. And suppose that O it will be an open neighborhood of the uh, closure of D. And if we have a function from on O, which is holomorphic, And it satisfies the following transformation law. And the transformation law is very similar to the law we had before, only here at the right hand side, uh, instead of having a particular functions prescribed by our problem, we allow ourselves having any functions h1 and h2. 
So And so we want this to be satisfied, so whenever both sides are defined. Uh, because, uh, because our function f is not defined on all upper half plane, but it's defined only in this uh, neighborhood O. And so suppose that these conditions are satisfied, then we claim that f can be extended to the upper, upper half plane. Uh, holomorphically. And this new holomorphic function, the extension, it will satisfy the condition, also the functional equa equation. And so, here, for the proof, uh, we make one important uh, observation. It is that the uh, rep representatives, we can choose representatives of uh, the quotient of a group algebra by the ideal i to be the same as uh, representatives of a group, of a quotient of a group uh, uh, SL to Z by its uh, subgroup gamma 2. So, and how it works, and it works in the following way. So let's consider our uh, fundamental domain. So this will be the domain D. So it, so it contain, consists of all points of the upper half plane with, with uh, the real part between 1 and minus 1, and these two uh, semicircles excluded. So the semicircles of radius 1 half around plus 1 half and minus 1 half. And so now what we can do, we can divide this domain D into six subdomains, and each of these subdomains will be a fundamental domain for the action of PSL to Z on the upper half plane. And so what we'll take uh, this domain here, and then we call it uh, F. And so F, it will consi consist of uh, points such that they are real part of is between 0 and 1. And also, we exclude these two big circles, so we write that absolute value of tau should be bigger than 1, and absolute value of tau minus 1 has to be bigger than 1. And it is a fundamental domain for the action of SL to Z on the upper half plane. And so if here this is F, then this would be the translate of f by the matrix t minus 1. Here, just remind again that t is uh, this matrix, and s it is uh, this matrix. And so here, it's uh, uh, this part, it's uh, image of f under the action of s. And here, it is s inverse, and here it's ds, and here it's sds. Uh, 
And so now what we claim is that it's that this element 1 d minus 1 s d s s it is a basis for for the quotient of the group algebra by the ideal i and so now let's uh, consider a colon vector with this uh, entries yes just before going through, but this functions h1 h2 could be arbitrary or they actually, actually they could be arbitrary but there's no relation yeah, yeah. Yes. In, in, in in principle there is no real relation And so what we uh, consider now, we, we consider this as a, this line as a, a colon vector, and let's call this colon vector M. So then it will be an element of uh, R to six. And so we see that the And so, call, so it's uh, elements of this vector. We'll also call them like m1, m2, m3, and so uh, m, m6. Then we see that the closure of D it's the union of this translates of the closure of F. And so, as we discussed it. Uh, in the previous lecture, so now we have a so we have a representation. Okay, so then maybe so so there exists a representation. So we denote it by sigma, and this sigma which I use now, it's slightly different from the sigma we defined last time, because in the previous lecture we used a different set of representatives for this quotient. But I don't want to introduce new letters, so I will also call it sigma. And then this will be the only representation I use for, for the lecture today. Uh, yes, yes, J6, I think. And so also we have the following maps. So now we remember that last uh, time <coughs> I discussed that this uh, ideal i, it is a free, ideal is freely generated by these two elements, t minus 1 squared and s t minus 1 squared. And so therefore we have the following two maps. So we all write them as an i from it goes from PSL to Z into R6. And this maps they are the the following that uh, so here okay, so i equals either one or two. And so we define this maps in the following way. If we take our vector m and multiply it by some uh, element gamma of PSL to Z on the uh, right, then what we get, we got, we would got, this would be the same as sigma of gamma times m plus t minus 1 squared times n1 of gamma and plus s t minus 1 squared and 2 of gamma. So and, uh, gamma is an element of uh, 
cell to Z. And this happens because we know that the, uh, the representation gamma is defined in such a way that difference between m times gamma minus uh, sigma of gamma times m, it will always belong to the uh, ideal, to the sixth power of the ideal i. And now each element in the ideal i, it can be uniquely represented as a sum of, of two summons. One of, of them is t minus one squared times some element of the ring and another is s t minus one squared times some element of the ring. So there are hope for we have a functions like this. And so now these functions, they and one and, and two, they will satisfy the cycle relation. So. And so the cycle relation is the following. If now we want to compute this function on the product of two elements of the group, then what we get will be the following. And so this should be true for both i equals 1 and 2. And so now So what do we do next? So now by uh, <coughs> we can shrink our uh, neighborhood O such that uh, uh, only, so if we had here our neighborhood D and somewhere above it we could have our neighborhood This would be neighborhood O. And so we can make a neighborhood O uh, smaller so that it intersects as little of its uh, uh, gamma 2 translates as possible. So, and because D is uh, uh, also a fundamental domain for gamma 2, so uh, at the end we see that. Uh, the only translates which seem to be necessary are this where here it's like by translates by t squared, by t minus 2, by uh, I think here it's s t squared s and by s t minus 2 s. We what we can arrive is that so the only gamma two translates of O intersecting or are the following one. So this would be the t squared O and t minus 2 O and s t squared s O and s t minus 2 s O. Is it D? Translation of D? Uh, mm, no. No, so what we want to, to take, so O it's a neighborhood of uh, the closure of D and what we somehow, what we want to do, we want to somehow it, it's not important for us which neighborhood of D we are considering. So for example, we can make it smaller as long as it is an open neighborhood. And to make it so small that if we take O and take gamma 2 translates of O, that they intersect, so to say, only as long as it is necessary. So we don't want it to intersect with some translate which is somewhere far, far, far away. We want all of them to be o only these ones where somehow this is unavoidable. And so now, 
what we also want to do, we want to take an open uh, neighborhood of the closure of F. And so also there exists an open neighborhood OF of the closure of F uh, such that, so what we want, we want that the uh, union of this tran translates of OF by our elements mg, they are uh, uh, coordinates of this vector m. So that they have to, th this union have to live inside of neighborhood O. And so we can also do it by taking this open neighborhood just small, small enough. And so we do it so that, so we want that each so in particular, if we take our f and slash it with this element mg, we want it to be uh, well defined on OF. for all j from 1 to 6. And here also we want uh, somehow to make this uh, OF small enough so that if we have different uh, PSL to Z translates of OF, we don't have unnecessary intersections. So we also assume that the intersection of OF with its PSL to Z translates is not zero. It's only if gamma, if gamma translate of the closure of F and F, closure of F, they share a boundary point. And so, namely, we will have, this will be the full list of elements of, so this omega denotes an element of PSL to Z, where this is true. And so this will be the elements S, T, T inverse, S, T inverse, ds and dst inverse. That blackboard we still might need it. And so, One. sorry. One. Uh, well, okay. Yeah. Yeah, probably one. Yeah, one, one also should be at the list, right? Thank you. Yes, and so now, <coughs> uh, what we are want to, to do, we want to make a sort of say vector valued version of uh, our function f. So, and so we do it in the following way. We define so vec f vector valued for us which would be the vector, column vector which trans consists of all translates of f by this, uh, by the elements of vector m. So it would be namely to be like this, so f So what is ex exactly what this notation means. And so <coughs> now it's about it would be a bit more convenient for us instead of uh, extending uh, uh, f and making sure that it satisfies functional equation, 
it's rather to extend, so now this uh, vector valued version of f, it is not defined on the domain d anymore, but now it's defined on a smaller domain f. So now I want to extend this function from vector valued function from f to the all upper half plane. And now we, have, we need to find the substitute for the functional equation. So we have to translate the functional equation into this vector valued language. And so the translation would be this following. So if we have for each tau in OF and each small omega in this set capital o omega, we have such that the image of <coughs> tau under the action of omega is still in the set OF. And so we denote it by this number by this element of the upper half plane by tau prime, we would have the following. So that the j, so the automorphic factor to the power minus k times the vector f evaluated at omega tau, or in vector value notation we can denote it like this, so it would be the same as f slash k. It has to be the following number. It has to be so the matrix sigma of omega times vector f plus the function h1. And now we slash this function which h1 with this vector n1 of omega. and the same with h2 and the function n2. And so now let's denote this formula by okay. sum, for example. And so now actually this uh, formula Sunny formula is uh, equivalent to our formula which we denoted by star on that blackboard. So now, so this formula is equivalent to to f satisfying the functional equation for all tau in the union of this six translates of the domain OF. And so now what we want to do, now we want to extend uh, our vector valued function F actually not, not only to the union of this neighborhood, but to the all upper half plane. And we will do it, so to say, by imitating uh, this equation. So now what we do, now we choose... What is capital omega? Sorry? What's capital omega? Uh, so, uh, so capital omega, it is this uh, set of elements. Oh, uh, I'm yeah. sorry. Okay. Yeah. Six elements. Yeah, six elements such that if we take uh, our like, fundament fundamental domain F of a cell to Z and its intersection with uh, Translation by this element is uh, not, not uh, empty. And so now what we want to do, we want to take actually any element of the upper half plane, so let, so let W be any element of the upper half plane. And so then we know that uh, <coughs> because uh, the domain OF it contains the closure of fundamental domain F. So we know that there exists for sure an element uh, gamma in the group PSL2Z. Uh, and some element tau, which is in this domain OF, such that W is a translate is a gamma translate of tau. And so now we will define a uh, 
the value of this vector valued function f at point w in the following way. So here we just for simplicity we multiply it by this autonom automorphic factor on this side. And so we set this to be the following. Values so So it is just an analog of the formula we had above, but now we replace uh, omega, which was an uh, element in this sub subset by any element of gamma. And so now what we uh, have to do, uh, we have to show that uh, the function defined in this way, at first that it's actually well defined, and then that it is also holomorphic. Too, too complicated way to prove the theorems, but mm -hmm. you see it's here because you have, uh, if consider reflections, kind of anti holomorphic mm -hmm. maps uh, of, of this full mm -hmm. it's uh, you have a group freely generated by four reflections. If you kind mm -hmm. of consider the image of this mm -hmm. by four reflections, then then it will be kind of easy. For example, you can translate by uh, two times integers, yeah, from the left mm -hmm. and the right using the first equation. Mm -hmm. It's, it means that you generate two, uh, consider like the hydro group generated by two reflections uh, with respect to one vertical line and another mm -hmm. vertical line. And then there's another group which is completely in the toxin of the has the same row and zero. And, and the whole thing, it will be more like, like, you know, like Mumford curves, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, short key description, you get like free group sitting in a phenomenal group of the surface. Mm -hmm. And here it's something similar, you get free group with not exactly four evolutions without yeah, any yeah, relations. So Nothing, yeah, nothing about number six will be in this. Yeah, yes, yes. I think like num number six here, it maybe it's not so uh, yeah, important yeah. thing here, but yeah, because it's kind of namely it proves that you can immediately from the first functional question can extend by shift by two. Yeah. Mm, yes, yes, yes. And shift by two, it's uh, like free group uh, this one generated. It's, it's mm, yes. index two by re two reflections by mm. plus minus yeah. one. Yeah. So, so. Yeah, so I think in a, in a sense, it is what we are. Yeah, probably well, doing because, but, uh, uh, because you also have some reality conditions, maybe it will be just really reflection principle at the end of the day without mm, any. Yes, yes, so yeah. Pro pro probably. Yeah. It's yeah, because your function is kind of real value, I suppose, so mm. on this boundary. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah but, but, here, okay, but here also there is this like H1 and H2, which like in this setting can be yeah. anything. So, yeah. so maybe, maybe we have to think a little. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that there might be some, maybe, more either easier way to do it, or maybe yeah. it already follows from some more gen some general some known results. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so maybe I'll still uh, finish the yeah. lo 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 long proof. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry for that. But Okay, so now what, what remains for us to do is to, like, before we find some better way of thinking about this, is that a uh, function defined by this uh, equation, it's actually, uh, it is first like well-defined because of course this uh, uh, 
gamma which we have chosen here, it's not uh, unique, right? So we, we, st we still could have this uh, ambiguity because of, for example, because of that set uh, omega, uh, and also that it is uh, holomorphic. So. So what we will do, suppose that so this uh, W has two uh, presentations. So suppose it has two possible presentations with two different elements in O F and uh, gamma and gamma prime in PSL two Z. Uh, then what we know is that by our definition of the set omega that uh, tau prime it has to be omega times tau for some uh, omega in our set uh, capital omega. And from this, we also see that gamma has to be gamma prime times omega. And so now <coughs> we can see that uh, we could have, so to say, two, two different definitions for uh, the value of. Uh, this uh, vector valued function f at uh, point w. So one of them uses gamma and tau, and another uses uh, gamma prime and tau prime. And actually, it will follow from the cycle uh, condition that these two uh, different pr presentations will coincide. So what we see is then. Here, uh, how we can uh, we write it. So now we can just use the here we use the fact that uh, sigma is a representation, and here we use that n1 and n2 to satisfy the cycle condition. And so from here we see that this would be the same as. And so here uh, we use the definition of our. Uh, so here we use this 
no, not the definition, but <coughs> this condition, which we know that it holds for all elements omega in a set uh, capital omega. And so we see that this now will be equal to for H2. Yes, and now we will see that some of the uh, terms will uh, cancel here. So namely, uh, this term here, it will cancel with uh, this term here. And this term uh, here, it will cancel with a term here. So, not, not, not maybe not okay, not all of them. Only the yes, only the first part. So this will stay, but this one will cancel. And here the same. So only this one will cancel, and this one will survive. And so from here we will get exactly the uh, representation as we as we hoped for. So, yeah. but of course, prob probably the easier solution is also possible. So this would be just the same as So here we would have so this part then equals to this part. So it would be the same as multiplied by So now, <coughs> up to this uh, automorphic factor, which actually is not a problem because it also satisfies the chain, chain condition. So from here, we see that this is exactly the, pre the presentation which we would get for uh, f vector valued if we uh, started with a different uh, representation of omega as a tr translation of a point in this domain uh, OF. So this tells us that so now we see that this function is well defined. Uh, 
also we know that uh, so it is a, a holomorphic uh, well-defined function which satisfies uh, this condition and so if a uh, vector valued f is well defined it means that one of its coordinates our initial function f is also well defined so it, it's also obviously it's a well defined at holomorphic and so this function is also well defined at holomorphic then it's holomorphic of course uh, because the uh, Yeah, because it's, uh, it's holomorphic in all translates of uh, OF, and so we, when we glue them together, we don't get uh, any discontinuities. And so if it's also well defined as holomorphic. And so now we know that this condition star it holds for extension of. of the vector valued version of f and so we know that the functional equation has to be true for the function uh, f itself because it's a holomorphic equation we know that it holds in <coughs> on in this uh, uh, open domain o and so it also has to be true at the all upper half plane And so now what I would like to do is uh, in the remaining part is to show that uh, our function uh, f capital which we defined by a certain integral representation that it indeed can be extended uh, to an open neighborhood of, uh, of this uh, domain D and that this extension will satisfy the functional equation. And then by, co by combining these two results, we would uh, obtain an uh, analytic continuation and also functional equation for, for the function f. And so, <coughs> so now what we want to show is that, so, so, so now we have that the function function f extends to a holomorphic function on an open subset which contains uh, 
the closure of the domain D and uh, this holomorphic extension then it satisfies the transformation law. Here we what we want to want to get to. zero here. And the So then this has to be uh, uh, for okay, so this will be times e to the And it will satisfy these functional equations. And so probably, so from the two uh, equations, probably I show only uh, the upper one. And so now this is, uh, so here the proof is also not uh, difficult. Here we just uh, use uh, the fact that we know the re residues of uh, our kernel K. And so by it, we can assure that the functional equation holds. And so how we do it, we do it in the following way. So, uh, so what do we do? So first we consider So here again, we somehow we will assume that so just for simplicity, we will assume that the absolute the norm of x is bigger than our critical value. And so now for, uh, now we take our tau in the upper half plane, and from the upper half plane we exclude all the uh, images of imaginary axes by the SL2Z. So So now, uh, when we excluded the imaginary axis, what we can do, we define a function like this. So we call it f sharp. So it would be a function like this. So. so it's exactly a function which has exactly the same integral representation as our function f. Yeah, 
So in this formula, uh, x changed into r, where r is the so say norm of our vector. So because we know that our functions are radial, so we can just look at this as the functions of uh, <coughs> of one real variable. And so now what we see that this function f sharp it will be a, a piecewise holomorphic function. So it will be holomorphic uh, uh, everywhere except on these uh, images of the imaginary axis and on those uh, images it will have some jumps. And so the jumps of course they will be controlled by uh, sort of like r residues of k and this func function here. And so now what we know is that for every alpha in SL to Z, uh, we know that the residue of it, now we look at this as a tau as a fixed number and Z as a variable, and we want Z to, to approach uh, alpha translate of T. Then we know that here this residue it will look like this. And so this will help us to understand the jumps of this function. And like another property of uh, fun I forgot to say about this function, so f uh, sharp, so f sharp it's uh, even though it's, it's not holomorphic anymore, but what we gained for this is that now this uh, function, it is, uh, so f sharp, it is, uh, uh, it satisfies the homogeneous functional equation because our kernel k satisfies the homogeneous functional equation. So. And so now what we can do, we can uh, so now what we would like to do, we would like to extend a function f uh, holomorphically outside of this uh, domain. And so one way how to do it, suppose that we have function tau, which is here just on the uh, boundary. And we would like to extend our function f, for example, to this uh, domain here. So this would be domain, for example, we can call it u. And u, it will be the set of all points w such that the real part of w is bigger than 1. And that the distance between this fixed tau and W is smaller than epsilon. And so now to extend it, what we have to do, we have to look first what are the translates on of tau, which of them lie on the the images of imaginary axis. So here it will be tau minus 1, and here will be tau minus 2. And so also here we will have uh, some translates here and here. But then if we go carefully to our uh, formula here and uh, recall what we how we defined our uh, linear functional phi, 
So then the only point of these four points which will cause uh, problems for us, now we are, remember that we are integrating on this path from zero to uh, infinity. And so the only points which will cause problems for us, it will be this point here. So what we have to do, we have to go like this. And actually for, for these points, uh, they, they will not contribute to the, uh, to the singularities because the residue of k there will be zero. So what we have to do, we have to change our contour of integration. So this would be some new contour, for example, we can call it uh, gamma. And so now we can define for if we have, okay, maybe let this be some, not just tau, but tau is zero, for example. So now for tau in this region u, we see we can define that f of tau r to be this. Find it like this. So instead of integration just from zero to infinity, we take this uh, new pass. And so now, what is important is to see what would be the difference between uh, our extension of f at this point and the function f sharp, which is also well defined on this set. And so now. We will see that now we see that the uh, difference here at exactly will be the, uh, the integral somehow ar around this point tau zero minus one. So by knowing the residue, we can uh, compute this explicitly. And so this is the answer. And also we know that actually that f of tau r actually equals to the f sharp of tau r for tau belongs to the fundamental domain. And so now if we take, for example, points like tau here, tau minus would be like tau, this would be tau minus one, and this would be tau minus two. So now from, also we know that This functional equation holds. So. From here, we can compute what would be this number, so f of So I think here I did one small mistake. So now that this is not zero, what is true is that, okay, so, so what satisfies functional equation is not F sharp, but rather F sharp minus the yeah. exponential. Okay, so this would be the same as, uh, so this is actually the same as exponential. So. applied the same functional equation, so maybe blah. So from here we can actually compute what is the and so now if we somehow 
don't make any more mistakes or make so a make, make a no minus one. Okay, yeah. Ah, yeah. Yes. So if you make no more mistakes or make correct number of mistakes, then we will obtain that here we have zero. And since for similar considerations, we can also prove the uh, second equation here. Yes. Uh, or functional question. Uh, 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 yeah, it's, it's on, uh, uh, on this blackboard. Yes, it's the of the okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Just so probably then it's uh, all, all for today, and then t tomorrow we will continue with some interesting numerics. <laughs>